So we're finishing up our discussion about connections between individual data and a vector of trait values. And now we're focusing the last two lectures on multivariate measures. So we talked about in the previous two lectures about looking at one trait at a time. Now what happens when you look at a vector of traits? Okay, so that's what our focus is. But as always, before I do that, we've covered a lot of stuff. Oh, there's a lot of empty chairs this morning. I'm gonna miss out on the binder. Um, any, uh, any questions about anything at all we've discussed so far? So what I'll do in, in this lecture is I'll review a fair bunch of things because remember we talked about gradients and differentials and quadratic and directional. And what we'll do is we'll take all those things we introduced for a single trait and extend the multiple traits. So we're going to come back and review all of those. And I've got a review slide that's about 15 slides in that will take care of that. So let me just kind of remind you. So the outline here is I want to talk about the multivariate versions of differentials and gradients and, and what their interpretation are. And then I want to talk about, again, I, I really quickly mentioned about a summary of strengths of selection. I want to go in a little more detail in that as well. And the key issue is that when you well, this is something we've talked about multiple times. If you have a trait under selection, or you observe a within generation change in a trait. So I've got a selected population, I measure a trait, then I measure that trait again after an episode of selection, and I see that trait mean, for example, is changed in my fitness weighted pool. The question becomes, has it changed because that trait itself is directly under selection, or does it change because it's correlated to a trait that's under selection, or, of course, as you might expect, is it some weighted combination of direct selection plus indirect selection? And so most of the methods we'll talk about will try to determine that. The problem is they all have this major constraint. And the major constraint was if I want to know the amount of selection directly acting on a trait, I need to include in my analysis all traits which are correlated with it, which themselves are under selection. And you never know that. So what you basically do is you use your intuition in your system and put in traits you think are relevant or put in traits you think may capture a lot of those, um, those other traits. So for example, it might be that you're interested in a specific measure of body shape under selection. So you put in a general metric for size because size is often under selection by itself. If you put in a variable for size, maybe the first principal component, then that will basically pull off all the size related selection and you can look at the amount of selection directly acting on your trait. So the problem with these analysis when you put in multiple traits is as you change the traits you put in, you can change your interpretation. Because what you're trying to do is put in enough traits that will capture not just your trait, but other traits correlated with your trait, but might be under selection. And we'll, we'll talk about different ways. For, for example, path analysis is a very interesting way to, to look at these. So what we're always trying to distinguish is a direct response from a correlated response. So what I want to do now is take the notion of a directional selection differential, S. That's an observed within generation change. We also have this concept a, of a directional selection gradient, beta. And we said how that had several geometric interpretations. The simplest is if, if I do a take my individual fitness data and simply do a linear regression, that is find the best fitting line that describes that, the slope of that best fitting line is, is given by the directional selection gradient. I don't want to take those ideas and make them multivariate. So, and again, this is all from Landy and Arnold following the work of Pearson. So we're going to define a vector V, and I've written the vector here as a row vector, but the transpose means we typically write it as a column. The reason it's not written as a column is it would take up a lot of space. Right? So our, our vector uh, in bold here, Z, is the value of trait 1 plus the value of trait 2 plus the value of trait n. So for each individual, I have, would have a vector of measurements. So I might, for example, your fitness might be pollination rates, and then associated with that vector for each individual would be measurements of flower size and flower shape and flower characteristics. So that's the type of data we have, is a vector or a list of traits for every single individual. What I can then do is measure, that's a bold mu, the mean, so I get a vector, which is the mean of trait one, mean of trait two, mean of trait n, of the entire population that I've sampled, and then a vector mu star, which is simply the means of those traits after selection. And recall when I say after selection, it means we take 
the individual fitness, and we weight the individual uh, 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 that individual by their frequency after fitness. It's simplest if it's live or dead, because you simply take a mean among the pools that, that are live. But if they have different number of mates, we talked about a couple lectures ago about how you weight this. So mu and mu star is the vector of means before and after. P and P star, so mu is a vector or a list. P here is an n by n uh, square array, an n by n matrix. And that's the variance covariance matrix of the phenotypes. So on the diagonal, variance to trait 1, variance to trait 2, to variance to trait n. On the off diagonal, and it's symmetric, so the 1, 2, and the 2, 1 elements are the same. And that's simply the covariance phenotypic between trait 1 and trait 2, 1 and 3, etc. So I've got a measure of means before and after, and I have a multivariate measure of now its variances and covariances before and after. So our data now become mu and mu star, p and p star. Okay, those are just the extensions of a single mean. Uh, and then when we go to multiple traits, we not we don't simply follow variances, but now we have how those values are correlated to covariances, and those come in. We have to keep track of those in a, in a variance covariance matrix. So mu and p mean and covariance structure beforehand, mu star and p star mean and variance covariance structure after selection. So the first obvious thing is the directional selection differential vector, S. When you, when you write something in bold that means that it's, a, it's a, you know, a matrix or a vector, the usual convention is lowercase bold as a vector, but because S, capital S, is used so widely, when we say capital S, we mean this vector of within generation changes. So it's the vector of mu star minus the vector mu. So what's the ith observation? Well. S5 is simply the mean of 5 after selection minus the mean of 5 before selection. So this is just the, the natural extension of that directional selection differential to now a list of directional selection differentials for our traits of interest. The Robertson-Price identity holds in that if I look at S, the ith element is simply the covariation between trait i and relative fitness. It also holds in terms of this upper bound with respect to the opportunity for selection. If I take the ith element and standardize it, that is, put it in terms of its phenotypic standard deviations, that's bounded above by the square root of i. And uh, of course, when we say this is the intensity is bounded above by the square root of the variance in individual fitness. So all the things we had for univariate selection hold for multivariate selection. Here is one way to think about what happens when you have phenotypic correlations. So the circle here, think of that as a cloud of points. Then in panel one, I have a threshold, and I select everything to the right of that threshold. So this point here is the value for trait one and trait two that's the mean beforehand. This point here is the value for trait one and trait two that's the mean afterwards. If the circle has, if the, the, the line has no tilt, by the way, it could be an ellipse, but if the ellipse is basically uh, on its side or straight up, that is, it doesn't have a, have a tilt, <clears throat> there's no correlation. So here, traits one and trait two are uncorrelated. I get a within generation change by selecting this slice. So I get a change in trait one, but not in trait two. If I take the same selection on trait one, but now the data show a positive phenotypic correlation, so that uh, tilt in the ellipse means that large values for trait 1 tend to be large for trait 2. Small values for trait 1 tend to be small for trait 2. If I do the same thing and, and again, only select based upon trait 1, here's the mean beforehand. If I take the mean of this little wedge over here, it's right there. There's the mean after. So now, in this case, I get a within generation change in trait 1 due to direct selection on it. But I also get a correlated within generation change in trait 2. In this case, it's positive because large values of trait 1 in an individual tend to mean they have large values of trait 2. If I have the slope in the opposite direction, a negative correlation, so large values of trait 2 mean small values of trait 1, large values of trait 1 mean small values of trait 2, go through the same exercise. There's the mean beforehand. Here's the mean of that wedge after. There's the within generation change in trait 1 due to direct selection on it. And there's the correlated change in trait 2 in this case negative. 
The key feature is in all three of these situations, the nature of selection is the same. What simply differs is the correlation pattern. So if I have, let's say, the trait one here is height, and then I have maybe um, nose length, ear size, and body weight, I would see no selection in trait one, positive in trait two, and negative in trait three, all from the same underlying thing that generates the actual selection. So determining a direct response from a correlated response, you simply can't do it by looking at within generation change. Because if you simply focus on S2 here, you'd imagine no selection, positive selection, negative selection, when in fact in all three cases, it's no direct selection on trait two, all the selection is on trait one. That's the issue of separating phenotypic correlations, which give you uh, your, your total response is direct plus indirect. What you want to do is to figure out some way of actually getting directly at the trait under selection. So as I mentioned here, direct effects. So in this case, trait one is always under selection. Indirect effects, what happens to trait two? The way we can take care of those is with the directional selection gradient, beta equals P inverse S. Now remember, if I had a regression, the slope of that regression for regressing y on a single value is the covariance of x and y divided by the variance of x. The multivariate version of that is the inverse of a variance covariance matrix times the vector of covariances. In this case, the covariance, since I'm trying to regress fitness on trait values, um, I'd take the variance covariance matrix of the trait values and then multiply that by the covariance between relative fitness and a vector of individual traits. We've seen that. That's just the Robertson price identity, right? This vector S is simply a vector of covariances between individual trait values and relative fitness. So when you see something like this, that's simply a regression. So these are regression coefficients. So that's basically saying what I said there before. Um, and what, did, what regression are those? Well, it's this regression here. I'm trying to regress relative fitness as a function of individual trait values. And there are several ways you can write this. I've written it this way so the intercept goes away. And remember, if I have a regression, that regression always passes through the, the point, which is the mean of y and the mean of all the x's. When I do that, the mean of y that is, is expected value of w, which is 1, and the mean of all the traits is this vector mu. So basically, if I'm trying to uh, do the best regression of relative fitness on my vector of traits, <clears throat> here's what it is. <clears throat> and remember the interpretation of beta in this case. So for example, if beta 3 is 4, it means a one unit generation change in trait 3 changes relative fitness by that amount. So betas basically are if I hold all other traits constant and change one particular trait, how much does that impact selection? And you see that then accounts for correlations because the notion of holding all other traits constant, P inverse basically does that bookkeeping for you and adjusts and takes care of differences in correlations and differences in variance. So right away we see the two fundamental things for directional selection. Directional selection is change in means. I have a vector of within generation change. That's the directional selection differential. What I really want is the directional selection gradient, which basically tells me of those traits I've looked at, what are the actual targets of selection? Whereas S here basically just says which traits change within a generation, beta tells me what are the actual targets. And in particular, we saw this for two traits. A change in trait i, if you basically, um, so if you basically write this as s equals p times beta and do matrix multiplication and look at the ith element in that. So the ith element is just sum of the beta j's times the pij. So basically you take trait i and you look at all the traits it's correlated with, including itself, and multiply them by the gradients. And so an observed change in trait i is due, number one, to any direct selection on trait i. So if beta is non-zero, there's direct selection on trait i, plus direct selection on any other traits correlated with i. So there's i, the traits you're interested in, and those are correlations running all over all the other traits. And so what you can see basically is the sign of beta 
the sign of the amount of direct selection on that trait is quite different from the actual observed change. You could have beta i be zero, but s i be positive or negative. You could have this be positive and s be negative. You could have that be negative and, and s be positive. So you just simply can't tell by looking at s what the nature of selection is. You have to look at other traits you think are correlated with it and under selection and put all those into a regression and compute what the betas are. The classic example of this is Steve Arnold. This is the one spotted bug. Legend has it, and since we put it in the book, it'll become codified. So Steve was basically walking on a beach after a storm um, on Lake Michigan. He was in Chicago at the time. And he, he uh, came across a situation that reminded him of Bumpus. What did Bumpus do? Well, he was walking out in an ice storm and saw all these frozen birds on the ground. So Steve was walking on the uh, shores of Lake Michigan and saw all these bugs that washed up in the waves from a storm out on the lake. And so he gathered them all. And of course, rumor has it he put them in his open adult beverage container because he's walking on the beach. And he basically, you know, those, those that, that appeared to be alive and those that were dead. So it's a classic redoing of the Bumpus story. And the reason they did this was they wanted to sort of, you know, test and see what, how, how their method worked. So basically, here are the bugs they had, and they are bugs, for the entomologists in here. Um, you looked at the head character, thorax character, sketellal character, and four wing nose. So four morphological measurements. And you could look at those four <coughs> morphological measurements and see if they're correlated in your sample, and then look at what happens in the set that survived and the set that didn't. So basically, here are the correlations. The SD there, by the way, means we've standardized them. So one, one thing you can often do, and you often see regressions do this, is you take your true value, subtract off its mean, and express it in standard deviations. So the SD means that I've standardized, in this case, variance standardized. And so what it means then is uh, a beta, let's say, of 0.2 means a one standard deviation change in that trait changes fitness by 0.2. So when you do that, here are the correlations. So what you basically see, there's head, thorax, cutella, forewing. You see uh, head and thorax are very strongly correlated. Basically, you see all positive correlations in here. Here's the within generation change that you saw. Uh, scutellar change was significant at the 5% level. Forewing change was highly significant. So that's your S. And if you assume that these are the four traits which are under selection, or any other traits under selection are correlated with these, so you capture, capture those, you then can compute what beta s is. So p inverse, take the inverse of that, multiply by s, and here's what you get. So let's compare them. So the only, there's noise, only look at the stars. So thorax <laughs> length here, you see a slightly negative within a generation change, but not significant. When you actually go through, what you see that's been under strong positive selection. Four wing length down here, you actually see the selection is a little bit stronger. So the main thing here is thorax. If you look at it here, you assume it's either not under selection or under very weak selection to get smaller. In reality, it was under quite strong selection to get larger. So you see that the differentials are quite misleading with respect to the values you get from the gradients. And as you see, this approach is pretty straightforward to carry out. You use your intuition to figure out which traits you think are important. You measure those traits. Then you simply do a regression. So there have been literally hundreds and hundreds of studies that have done this basic idea where you measure some component of fitness and then ask, what's the target of selection? Okay. So that shows the difference between directional selection differentials observed within generation changes and directional selection gradients. So a key part here is the direction selection differentials do not change. You simply measure them, that's it. However, the betas can change because as you add or subtract characters, the targets of selection, uh, the, uh, the, 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 your inference about targets of selection may change. So if you, for example, if thorax is under no selection and you add a whole bunch of characters that are themselves not under selection, uh, and not correlate with thorax, it's not going to change. But if you add the actual target of selection, then all of a sudden that beta for thorax, for example, will go to zero. So S never changes, 
but your inference about beta changes as you put potentially different traits in. So that's the that's a critical limitation in the method, but again, it's it's a good approach basically for trying to ask among a given set of traits if these are the traits that selection is acting on. And I want to stress, selection could be acting on other traits, they're just simply not correlated with your traits. So if these are the traits selection is acting on, you can then partition where the actual targets are in your source. So questions so far about S versus beta. Observe changed inferred targets of selection. The inferred target selection depend upon what traits you put in. The observed change, of course, never changes. If I add 20 traits, the observed change doesn't change. But if I have a certain observed change and add or subtract traits, my beta may change because my inference may change. Yes. That's fine. Absolutely. Yeah. Sure. So you, that's a great point. So one of the unresolved issues that people are working on is trying to figure out if you've captured everything. One obvious way to do it is to look at the variance in fitness and ask how much the variance in fitness is accounted for by your traits. Now that may not do the job. The reason it may not do the job is suppose all five of your traits. I'm the actual target of selection. But if you and I are very highly correlated, you get a pretty big R squared in terms of accounting for it. So you assume, oh, I must have the proper thing in the analysis, when in fact what you have is you picked out a surrogate variable that's highly correlated with the actual target. So that, that's the, 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 the issue you always have with these methods. And that's kind of where your intuition is at about your system comes in. Your intuition may be dead wrong, but it's where your intuition about the system comes in. And other things, for example, looking at pollination syndromes. You may have some idea about how pollinators work, and that will inform you about reasonable traits to include or not include. So differentials and gradients, and these are directional because I'm looking at changes in means. We'll come back and talk about changes in variances and covariances. Let's now talk a little bit about the geometry. So it wouldn't be a last day without multivariate calculus and new stuff from matrices, right? We don't just send you away like you haven't gotten your money's worth. So recall the gradient vector. We'll use this notation. And that simply means I have a function, and I take the elements of the vector are the derivative with respect to element 1, element 2, element n. So it's a gradient. And remember, what a gradient basically does is it says, if I'm at this point, the gradient of the function at that point is the direction you point in to have the function changed most rapidly in some small local neighborhood. And the way to think about that, remember your idea about a Taylor series. If I've got a function uh, and the direction the, the gradient vector gives me the first order term in the Taylor series about where I would locally expand largest. What you can show, and the book shows this, is if you take the gradient of log mean fitness, which is the same as 1 over mean fitness times the gradient mean fitness. That's what beta is. So if the traits here follow a multivariate normal distribution, then beta has this nice interpretation. P inverse S, beta, has this nice interpretation. It's the gradient with respect of, of the mean to log mean fitness. And what that means here is if my data are sitting here, beta tells me the direction I want to change the means of those traits to get the largest increase in mean fitness. So there's a nice evolutionary interpretation. There are other ways you can interpret beta. So here, it's remember we, we, we call this surface a fitness landscape, right? We call fitness surfaces a plot of individual fitness versus phenotype. We call the plot of mean fitness versus population, mean that is a population average. I take an individual fitness surface, and then I average it over the distribution for that population. We call this surface here a landscape. So beta is the gradient of the fitness landscape with respect to the mean when the trait values are multivariate normal. Another interpretation is, again, um, if the trait values are multivariate normal, 
beta is the expected gradient vector of the individual fitness surface. So if I take the individual fitness surface and compute an average value for that, that also equals beta. So in beta's multivariate normal, it each equals the average of the individual fitness surface. I'll have a summary slide giving all this stuff again. And the gradient with respect to uh, the, the, the landscape surface. And you can, that basically shows where that comes from. So basically we have these, let me jump to the summary slide here. And we'll come back. So here's what we've talked about so far. If I look at changes in means, directional selection, Differentials measure the covariance between relative fitness and trait value. The opportunity of selection bounds what S can be for any value, any distribution of Z. Differentials confound direct and indirect effects. So if I actually look at what the value for SI is, it's this direct selection on our trait plus any indirect selection on any correlated traits. So pure properties of differentials. Gradients measure the amount of direct selection, P inverse S for the mean. Uh, the interpretation, if, if uh, the data, if, if the traits are multivariate normal, then the ith term in beta is simply the partial of the fitness landscape, that is how population fitness changes as a respect to changes in trait I. Again, if I've got multivariate normality, then Beta i then is simply the average of the individual fitness surface. So it's a gradient with respect to the fitness landscape. If I change the mean in trait i, how much does mean population change? That requires the traits are normally distributed. Likewise, if traits are normally distributed, beta is also the average. So beta i is the average slope over all the individuals in my sample for that fitness surface. And then we'll come back to these interpretations a bit later. So that basically shows some of the features we wanted to talk about in terms of differentials and gradients, change in mean, so they're directional. And differential is what you observe, gradient is what you infer by, by putting what you think of the appropriate amount of characters in there. And the nice thing about beta, it has nice interpretations in terms of <coughs> geometry. And we'll talk about one more in terms of individual fitness surface a bit later on. That's a good point. That's something you can check. The general approach people have is the usual departure from multivariate normality is you have data that have a fairly wide spread. When they have a fairly wide spread, small things tend to have smaller variances. Big things tend to have larger variances. So very commonly people take the log of data and that tends to make things a little bit closer. So remember the multivariate normality basically comes in in terms of these gradients here. If you don't have multivariate normality, that's that Janssen-Stern gradient I talked about and the Morrissey gradient. Well, you, you can basically compute these numerically and we'll talk about that as well. So these are what beta amounts to if your data are multivariately distributed. If I don't have multivariate normal data, I can still compute beta, which is P inverse times S, but the, the values for this landscape gradient and this average gradient then will be different from beta, but I can attain those numerically. This is, by the way, this is the thing here that drives how the character traits change. Gradients with respect to landscape. I didn't tell you where that is, but the book, the book chapter 24 covers that. So we've talked then about changes in the means. The other thing, of course, can happen is changes in the variance. I have a variance covariance structure P before selection, and a variance covariance structure P star after selection. So a selection can increase or decrease the variance of a trait. It can also increase or decrease how two traits co-vary with respect to each other. So you have a much richer description that's now needed when you move from talking about a single trait change in the variance to a vector of traits, how their covariance structure changes. Because not only can their variance change, but how those individual traits are associated can change. So recall we had the quadratic selection differential C, and for a single trait, we basically showed that that was um, defined by the change in the variance plus S squared to correct for that, and we showed for a single trait 
that's the same as the correlation between, sorry, the covariance between relative fitness and the deviation of the trait from the mean squared. If I have multiple traits, I can show this definition here, C star, which is the variance covariance matrix after, minus the variance covariance matrix before, and plus this thing. So if you look at SS transpose, that's called an outer product. If I've got n characters, that's an n by n matrix, that's an n by n matrix, that's an n by n matrix. And the ith shape element is simply given by this. So that's the multivariate extension of the quadratic selection differential. Because by adding on this term, you're accounting for the fact that when you have directional selection, it also changes the variances. And in particular, um, it changes the variances according to this. So basically, if you if uh, the the if I look at PII star minus PII, you simply get minus SI squared. So it always reduces the variance directly on the trait. What about the covariances? Well, now it depends upon the signs of these things. So this expression here, which is the multivariate version of variance after minus variance before plus S squared, also equals what we expect, and it equals this thing here. The matrix here, basically, is the ith jth element is the covariance between relative fitness and trait i from its mean and trait j from its mean. So if i and j are the same thing, that's square deviation from the mean, that's a covariance. If i and j are different, the deviation of one from its mean and the other from its mean, that's the definition of, of a covariance. So this is the multivariate extension of our quadratic selection differential. Again, it's a within generation change, and again, it confounds direct selection on the covariance and variance with indirect selection from other traits. And you can go through the same argument before and basically then show you can then put a bound on how much the ith jth element of that changes with respect to the phenotypes, and you can then express that in terms of the opportunity for selection. So just like we could bound the change in variance for a single trait from the opportunity for selection, we can also bound the change in variance for not just a uh, single trait, but for multiple traits, we can bound the changes in variances and covariances. Again, the critical point there is that you can bound it, not what the value is. You look up the value. So just like we had a gradient to match the differential, that is, the differential is what you observe, the gradient is what you infer from the, the traits in your thing, we can also have a quadratic selection gradient gamma in this case now, it's a matrix. So the interpretation of that is if I fit a quadratic regression, and here's that best quadratic regression, if I go ahead and, and fit that, the terms here on these quadratic products are elements in this quadratic selection gradient. And I simply get that by P inverse, that's C times P inverse. And that's the multivariate version we had before of C divided by uh, this, the, the variance squared. This is the multivariate version. So the ith jth element in here basically gives you the coefficient on here. So what does that mean? Suppose that, that gamma ii, so for trait i, suppose that's positive. Well, I've got positive times this squared. And what that means then, as this deviation gets further and further from the mean, that's positive fitness increases. So a positive value of gamma i i means I've got a convex fitness surface. As I move away from the means, fitness increase. That could be disruptive selection, but more generally it simply means the fitness surface has a positive curvature. A negative value of gamma i i means as I get further and further away from the mean, my fitness goes down. That means I've got a concave fitness surface. And so as I move away from the optimal value, or, or fitness goes down, or more generally, the surface is just curved downward. So if I move out from it, fitness goes down. What about for traits i and trait j? Well, if that's positive, it means you're selecting for positive correlations between trait i and trait j. If it's negative, negative correlations. If it's zero, fitness doesn't change on that. So the regression basically gives you a way to think about what these coefficients means. 
for the diagonal coefficients, positive values means, um, I'll call it in air quotes, disruptive selection. The fitness surface in that direction is curving upward. Negative values of gamma means the fitness surface in that character direction is curving downward. And values here basically tell you about correlations between them. We're going to come back in the second lecture and talk a lot about what the geometry of that is. So we're going to come back and, and come back to this, this work. So just like directional selection gradients are in a regression, and if, they, if this data is multivariate normal, this term here would be the beta, beta j's. If it's not multivariate normal, this is still correct, but this could be something different. So we have a quadratic selection gradient. In this case, it's a matrix of values, and that's the multivariate extension of the quadratic selection gradient we had for a single value. And let me again go back to our table here to put it together to remind what we have before. So we talked about uh, uh, changes in means. Here are the corresponding expression for changes in variances. So the differential ij measures the covariance between fitness and i from its mean and j from its mean. The opportunity for selection bounds the possible change in the differential. The gradient basically is a function that involves, um, so basically what we, you can show here is what is the uh, change in the combination i and j. If gamma is the direct target, what you see is it's this complicated structure here. So what this basically says is if trait i, sorry, if trait k is correlated with trait i and trait l is correlated with trait j, if there's any selection on that combination, that will contribute here. So just like we saw that a, uh, a directional selection differential is a composite of direct and indirect effects, the same is true even more so for quadratic selection differential. The gradients are defined here, P inverse S for linear, P inverse C, P inverse for quadratic, and we'll come back and talk about some of the geometry in a second. So this table basically here shows you linear terms, quadratic terms, and the connections between them. This is kind of the canonical table that kind of goes over all the various things we've talked about and sort of makes the connection. Because there's a lot of parts flying around, and this kind of shows you how they're similar and how they're connected and how they're put together. So let's go back and ask just a couple of more things on here. Again, this is a regression. The SD means you standardize. And by standardized, you simply basic, you basically um, take the z values, subtract them from the mean, and multiply by the inverse divariance covariance matrix. That basically removes any correlation. Uh, sorry, that that um, that uh, gives them all unit variance. So you basically can adjust these to subtract off the mean and divide each one by the by each value by the square root of its variance, and that then gives you standardized values which have. Uh, mean zero and variance one, and just makes the regression a little bit simpler. So let's look at an example. And the example comes from work that Butch Brody did, where he was looking at garter snakes and looking at two characters, number of reversals, when they move around do they change direction, and body stripes. And he was asking if these anti-predator morphology and behavior, anti-predator because the stripes blend you in, the reversals mess up something that's tracking you. Do those, um, what's the fitness surface on this? So when you go ahead and fit, this, here's the, the, the gardener snake. When you fit the fitness surface, here's what it looks like. That's a topography top down. That's a peak, that's a peak, that's a valley, that's a valley. It's this saddle point. And what you'll notice is that there's no, as a saddle point, there's no, op, there's no peak in it, right? You've got fitness going up here and down there. So what this basically says is that what you favor is a low stripe index with lots of reversals or a high stripe index and very little reversals. And so almost all the selection here is not on reversal rate or amount of stripes, but rather it's, it's on the correlation between those. So your best strategy is to either do lots of reversals and have little stripes or have lots of stripes and do little reversals. And you can kind of argue about that. Stripes make you a bit easier to see if you change direction. So you don't want that. 
If you don't change direction, the stripes make you a little bit harder to see. So the, the, the sort of behavioral ecology suggests what you see from the fitness surface is you have a couple of different areas. So this is where you basically infer that by simply fitting it, and this basically is the structure of that surface that's given by that gamma matrix. And we'll talk about how you get these structures um, this afternoon, uh, in the next lecture. The other, uh, which seems like a trivial comp, but it's actually rather important. If you look at the structure you expect for two traits, that's what the landy arnold regression has. So it's gamma 1, 1 over 2 times trait 1, gamma 2, 2 over 2 times trait 2, and then gamma 1, 2 times this. If I simply call out a quadratic regression, that quadratic regression returns B11 on Z1, B22 on Z2, and B12 on that. A fair number of studies, in fact, 80% um, uh, of the 33 studies that were examined in this meta-analysis, they forgot to correct for that. So if you get this regression, that's not gamma 1, 1. That's gamma 1, 1 over 2. You've got to multiply that value by 2 to get the correct gamma value. So a lot of the, the gamma values were underreported because people simply made this very simple uh, mistake about <clears throat> would you get the regression out realizing that what Landy Arnold asks for is this term here is gamma ii over 2, and people just take bii as, as gamma. So when you just use these, you've got to multiply that by 2, multiply that by 2, and these exactly match. So minor detail, but a minor detail that influenced the number of papers so basically, most papers before 2008, there's a good chance that a significant fraction of them have underestimated the magnitude of their gamma values because of that, that mistake. Let me just say that a couple things about geometry for these curved surfaces, then we'll put all the stuff together and go back to that table once again. So the Hessian matrix. So remember the gradient was a vector I have n traits, derivative of the fitness surface with respect to trait 1, trait 2, trait 3. The quadratic extension of that is a matrix where I have a function, and the i-th -th element is the, is the second derivative of that function with respect to um, trait i and trait j. So on the diagonal, it's second derivatives with respect to trait i. On the off-diagonal, it's the second partial with respect to i and j. And we assume that mixed partials are equal, which is a continuity condition, not a big deal. So this matrix then is symmetric. And that's called the Hessian matrix. So if you have multivariate normality, what you can show then is this matrix gamma is the expected average value of this matrix over all the individuals in your sample. The other thing you can show from a geometric standpoint is, remember, this is individual fitness, so the average of individual fitness. This is a landscape. That's mean fitness. You can show the Hessian with respect to mean fitness also gives you gamma, but now with this correction that basically adjusts for directional selection. So under multivariate normality, this matrix gamma, that's the average of the individual slopes, or you can relate it to the, the, uh, the curvature of the fitness landscape. So just like beta had geometric measures, Gamma also has those geometric measures. So here you go. Here are those geometric measures. So beta i is simply the, uh, the uh, partial of the, the, I th the, the, the fitness landscape. So basically how relative fitness changes as I change trait i. Gamma i i is the curvature of that relative fitness landscape plus a correction. That's if traits are multivariate normal. Likewise, the traits are multivariate normal. The, the gamma i j term here is simply the average curvature in that direction, just like we have an average slope over here. And then for fitness regressions, if I have multivariate, so in general, this is correct. So for a linear regression, the slope term corresponds to beta. For a quadratic regression, the quadratic term corresponds to gamma. This here doesn't necessarily correspond to beta unless the data are multivariate normal. If the data are multivariate normal, then this term, the linear term in a quadratic regression, corresponds to the linear term in the linear regression. And the reason they often de depart is if characters so, so skew, um, uh, when you fit in here, 
this takes care of a bit of skew and, and adjusts that, and the book talks about it. Finally, the reason that the beta and the gamma are so important is there the coefficients you need to describe how characters change. So the change in mean is given by G beta, where G is a variance covariance matrix of your breeding values. The, the, the change in G within a generation, G star, is again, is now given by gamma and beta. So gamma and beta, not S and C, are the quantities that you use to basically figure out how traits are gonna change over time, what their mean vector is gonna change, and what their variance covariance structure is gonna change. So these are the two kind of slides here. There's a bunch of stuff going on. And so the thing to look at are these slides because they show the connection between uh, directional and quadratic, and they show how the features are, are, are very similar. And again, the key idea is differentials, observed changes, confound direct and indirect effects. Gradients, inferred changes, given the characters you put in, basically separate those, and they also describe nice features about geometry. And those nice geometric features then also map into how you expect those traits to change over time. So most of the focus then is on gradients because gradients have these nice geometric features and also tell you about what the expected evolution is going to be. So questions? Kind of a lot of stuff to throw at you. Yeah. No problems. Sure. So what's the what's the basic what's the basic rule when there's some uncertainty about how to proceed? Do both. Do both. No, we're seriously. No, no, do both. Do both and and see what the data tells you. If it really doesn't matter. So one of the concerns would be if you're going to standardize, standardize using the initial values. And the, the reason you might take all the data in is because if you've got, let's say, you have a central a uh, big, uh, what organism are you working with? So what plants? What family is that in? Okay, so monkey flower type relatives and things like that. So you have a scroff. Okay, I love when people say plants. It's like, what are you working with, animals? It's okay, it's okay, it's, you know, we, we're, we're very, you know, forgiving audience, it's okay to actually tell us what your plant species is. Um, so if you've got a, let's say you have a, a base population of plants, then you sample from that to make your founding populations and then proceed on that, what you basically are wanting to have some inference on is what's that initial covariance structure. So if you average over all the initial estimates, you're getting a better estimate of what your starting population founding was. That would be the argument for basically standardizing with respect to an average of those. But you that, do that at the start of the experiment. As the experiment proceeds, you change variances. So you don't standardize using the end results. You standardize using the initial values, or even better, if you've got some estimate from your base population, you standardize using that. Now, there'll be a slight error. When I sample from that base population, sampling is gonna give me slight variations in that P structure over my population, I wouldn't worry about that being a big deal unless your sample sizes are extremely small. So do them both. The argument for standardizing using a weighted average is your, your, that a weighted average is a better estimate of that initial founding piece structure you're pulling out of. But you may, you may have sampling issues that give the starting piece structures quite different values, and you want to look at those now. The other thing, of course, is there's no reason you have to standardize. You just treat the data as they are. So you now have three things you can try, right? And three things to try doesn't mean, oh, which one should I use? It means do them all and see what the data tells you. If data says there's really no difference between the methods, then you're fine. If the data says you get rather different results, that's telling you something, and that's good to know. So when you're faced a choice with different ways you can analyze your data, analyze them all those ways. The only mistake you can make is to analyze them and only report the one that was significant, right? If you analyze data multiple ways, 
you just simply say, when I, when I do this, here's what I get. When I do that, here's what I get. So it's significant doing it this way. And then you can do, for example, a multiple corrections. So that's the, the downside of using multiple different approaches is you lose power through multiple corrections. The upside is you're much more transparent to the reader as to what you've actually done. Yes? Sure. Well, so the, the, the issue is people often standardize this, and the main reason they standardize it is so you can compare betas. So if you standardize it, then you compare the betas across different traits. So if you standardize it, a, tra a, a, a trait that has a larger magnitude of beta has been under stronger selection. If you don't standardize it, those betas are a function of the actual selection and the trait variances. So standardization is simply one thing that helps you interpret the data, but you're certainly not required to do that. So the idea, so let's, so let's go back and, and ask what's going on here. So what happens is you have a population which has a certain covariance structure, then you have an episode of selection and you want to compute a gradient. So in that case, you want to standardize the population at before the selection occurs and then ask what the change is. And in the chapter, we talk about some papers by Wade and Kalitz, which basically talk about if you have multiple episodes of selection, so your, your variance covariance structure is changing, we talk about how you standardize those. And it sounds like, what, the reason I'm a little concerned is it sounds like you want to standardize every generation. Let's keep on updating it. So generation one, generation two, update it. Generation one, generation three. And the way to do it, basically, is always have your reference be generation zero. So one was zero, two was zero, three was zero, four was zero. I think that's a better way to look at it. But again, the bottom line is don't get too hung up on should I standardize or not. Ask what question are you asking? Right. Okay, so there you go. So standardization simply makes it easier to compare things. So suppose you have two traits. Let's say you've got uh, wing length and tarsus length. And if you standardize, the trait with a larger beta is the one that's experiencing more selection. If you don't standardize, you could have a larger beta in wing length, not because the actual amount of selection is stronger, but because wing length has a higher variance. So the standardization simply is a way to help you interpret the regression coefficients, but it's not at all required. Yeah, yeah. So the thing about these is, is it's really easy to overthink problems, right, because there's so much stuff going on. So the way that the good strategy to get around that is to always ask yourself, What's the question I'm trying to address? People often get really bogged down in the details about the analysis, and therefore they just, the, the question they're trying to address is often sort of overlooked, and they don't come back, and they don't anchor their analysis to the question. It's the same idea about I give you a toolbox so you can let the question dictate the tools, not the tools dictating the question. You should let your question dictate your analysis, not let the analysis dictate your question. So it's always good to think about, you've got, people get excited about their data. A lot of work to get collect data. It's fun, it's exciting. But you want to basically step back and say, what is the goal of these data? What particular questions am I asking? Now those questions may get modified as you start looking at the data. But nonetheless, it's always good to step back and ask, what's the question I'm trying to address? Because very often people worry about the analysis first, instead of what's the question I'm trying to address? And they get hung up in the analysis, they often forget the question. Okay, done? Yeah, yeah. Sure. Sorry, thinking about real, real. Oh, fitness is always, so I should back up. So 
fit, fitness is all, so one thing is always standardized is these regressions are based upon relative fitness. And that's because they all come back to Robertson Price. Robertson Price requires relative fitness. So in each treatment, you, so basically what you're asking is what's the relative treatment in your particular experiment? So if I have two independent experiments, fitness value is over here of no bearing over here. What you're simply asking is, so what is relative fitness? It simply says, um, I standardize my population of interest so a random individual has fitness one. So if a random individual on average has 4.5 offspring, you divide all the offspring numbers by 4.5. If this population over here has three offspring, and this is four offspring, you divide these by four, these by three, you don't divide them both by the average of those two. So relative fitness basically says, in my population of interest, what's the, what's the average fitness of a random individual? It should be one. So you take their average fitness by your measure and, and correct for it. It depends upon the question you're asking. If your questions are inferences specifically within each of those populations, that's your relevant comparison. If your inference is on the collection of populations jointly together, then you want to treat the fitness as those measured together. So different, different, different traits may give you different fitnesses, right? But you don't worry about what traits are in there. You simply average, you just simply standardized fitnesses independent of the traits. So if you, and the reason I'm being a bit careful is that you're giving me a sentence about what your design is, and it could be much more involved. So I'm, at, I'm trying to basically give you the logic you'd go through. And so if you have two different groups, and the other thing you can do, of course, is you can simply report relative fitnesses within the two groups. The concern would be, if you're asking questions separately, you treat those as separate. If you're trying to make some pool thing, like, this trait is more important. Well, is that trait more important when you hand pollinate it and consider just that, or when you open pollinate and consider that, or when you've got a mixture? Those are three different questions. Well, so selection would be different means fitness would be different. But again, quite, I mean, if you, again, you have to give me a framework or give yourself a framework of what you're trying to ask. So are you worried about the joint inference? So if I'm measuring selection, some populations could be on serpentine soil, some on normal soil, and therefore they experience a different amount of selection. So how should I standardize? Well, if I'm concerned with fitness over everyone, then I standardize with respect to everyone. If I'm concerned with just fitness in serpentine soil, I use just those individuals. Just different soils, I use just those individuals. So the answer is it depends upon the question you're asking. Yeah. Okay. If you're gonna use if so, if your analysis is and that's pooling the data all together. So if you're gonna do that, then you standardize by relative fitness of everyone. Yeah, that's a good point. I hadn't I hadn't caught that. Yeah. Yes, and give you an example why. Suppose that you have an, uh, a, a non-isomeric metric relationship among your traits, so as, tr as body size changes, the relative shapes change, simply as a function of body size. You would then, if you didn't know that, look at these two rather different structures and measure all sorts of things, make all sorts of inference, and when in fact suppose selection is entirely on body size. Your analysis would miss that. And you have some incorrect inference based 
by focusing on these structures, which change as you change body size. In, in this hypothetical example, uh, not necessarily. Well, we'll talk about how you include latent factors in a second. But again, in this hypothetical example about having two different structures, if the parts of those structures grow at different rates as body size changes, those structures will change over body size. That if fitness is on body size, that will then create correlations between changes in those structure and changes in fitness. Using those, you make incorrect inferences. You say, oh, in this flower shape, as my stamen length gets longer relative to petal length, I get more pollinators. When in fact, it's just simply bees like big flies, or big, big flowers. So you, 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 you by you, you, get, you always run the risk of making incorrect inferences by not putting, if, you, if, you're, if you're concerned about a suite of characters, that suite of characters may be entirely, their fitness may be entirely driven by something else. Well, but you are making more about the, the evolution of the structure because you want to, uh, you're, you're, if you want to ask how that structure changes, you want to use the correct betas. And the correct betas would be those that include the, the factors such as actually acting on. Think about it. You, you, you would be making incorrect. When you don't include the actual targets of selection, you end up making incorrect inferences. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So, so, yeah, so we're actually confounding two things here in experiments. Number one, we're simply talking here about I measure traits within a generation. I see how they connect to fitness. So some of the discussion here is if I'm following a trait over multiple generations and trying to make inferences about how that trait changes, that's a different topic because that also requires you to know something about the inheritance. When you cross generations, inheritance comes in. And so chapters 18, 19, and 20 basically talk about how you analyze selection experiments where you're looking at traits over multiple generations. Where the concern there is simply how do the trait values change? Our focus here is what's the targets of selection? If you look at evolution, that is cross-generation changes, it's targets of selection plus details about inheritance. So the analysis of selection experiments is a slightly separate issue from asking what traits are direct targets of selection, because we're entirely concerned here on within generation changes. Selection experiments typically worry about how does the trait change over time. Those are cross-generation changes. That's a function of both the nature of selection and also the genetic variation. If I have two traits, Trait one is under really, really strong selection. Trait two is under weak selection. Trait one has no heritability. Trait one won't evolve. I mean, its mean will change by drift, but it won't evolve, even though there's lots of selection. So when you cross generation, not only does selection matter, but the inheritance matters. So we, 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 we're looking down the So let's, I, I, I mentioned briefly about strengths of selection in the last lecture. I want you to say a couple more things. And again, all the references for these and, and details are in, are in uh, chapter 30. Uh, so I mentioned these, these papers by Hoekstra and King Solver and all in these meta-analysis, and I gave you this curve here. And one of the questions that comes up is, how strong is selection and is that really strong? The other thing that comes up is, are, are there other questions we can ask about trade-offs? So one thing is, when you look at this curve here, notice it says absolute value of beta. That turns out when you use absolute value, and you show the absolute value here is, uh, has a median value of 0.16, that's an overestimate of the true values. Why is it an overestimate? If I take absolute values, what am I doing? I'm taking things and reflecting about zero, and therefore any noise, any error, any variance in estimates gets stuck into here. So these estimates are inflated by taking the absolute value and basically inflated by, yeah, here's how they're, 
they're inflated by a term here. So when you take an absolute value, if you look at the expected value of that absolute value versus the observed value, the observed value is inflated by your sampling error. Because you're not taking a mean, you're basically taking a square. Absolute value is taking a square and taking a square root. That's how, how it basically works. So these, these are actually overestimates. So the observed value here, so I'm going to put it another way. If I take the expected value of x, that's different from the expected value of a sample of x. So if I, if I take the expected value of this thing, that isn't equal to, uh, it's equal to the, this expected value plus an error. And so these things here get inflated by this sampling error. And Morrissey talks about this, and they talk about it in the chapters. So when you make that correction, and he basically uh, uh, suggested that, that uh, you're probably inflating it by about 50%. So instead of being about 0.16, the actual true value is probably maybe half of that 0.08. So these strengths of selections are overestimated by using absolute value because you're not accounting for sampling noise, and that inflates the absolute value. Yeah, question. Tons. See Appendix 4. <laughs> when they, uh, so Morrissey talks about that a lot. right? And, and so he's got a couple of nice papers about that. And Appendix 4 and also Chapter 29 goes in detail a lot about how you try to correct for file drawer effects and other things. And talks about different measures of publication bias, like funnel plots and things like that. So here's kind of updated data. And so one of the things that's interesting is here is survival and mating success. And the fact you've got a kind of a larger tail here suggests that mating traits may be under stronger selection than survival traits. If you go over here, you can look at survival, which is has a pretty high peak. So this is beta here. Mating success here has a, so the broader shoulders here mean you have more values at higher levels, so stronger selection. So this was the kind of, there's been several waves of meta-analysis of these data. And the second wave suggested that, well, maybe mating success is under stronger selection than viability. And the, 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 the concern was that's probably a very biased set of characters. Because for survivability, you kind of measure a ton of stuff and then look for associations. For mating success in characters, we're typically measuring characters we think are important in mating success. So it's, again, an ascertainment issue. So, for example, mating success in long-tailed willowbirds. I think I'll measure the tail. That's going to bias it. Whereas measuring beak size, ask about mating success, you would measure beak size to look at survivability. So one of the concerns here is that this result here suggesting that mating success may have stronger selection. There's a strong element of ascertainment bias in there. How strong it is, we're really not quite certain. But the median value for viability is about 0.15. It's about 0.25 for mating success. So what does that mean? It means here, a one standard deviation change in the trait has an average effect on viability of reducing it by about 15% whereas a one standard deviation for the traits measured mating success has an effect of changing absolute fitness by about 0.25. But again, there's the concern about them being ascertained. You look at quadratic selection gradients. Again, these are probably underestimates because most of the early studies simply looked at the quadratic regression coefficients that the computers spit out. So the quadratic correction coefficient on trait one was 0.4. That coefficient is gamma over two. The correct coefficient should be 0.8. A lot of the early studies, over half of them, didn't do that. So there's probably more values out here and here. It still doesn't issue, uh, get at the problem, though, of how come this is symmetric. If stabilizing selection is important, we'd expect more values to be in over here. So one way we'll talk about it is that the gammas by themselves turn out to be not what you want. And we have to talk a little bit about multivariate fitness surfaces. So we're going to come back and talk about that. But these basically are measuring, if I have a series of traits, what are the gammas on those traits? Multivariate fitness surfaces says it's not the traits that matter. It's the combination of traits. 
So you may have pretty weak selection on a couple of traits, but if you look at the multidimensional fitness surface, there's an axis with really strong stabilizing selection, and it weakly projects on the individual traits. So you want to actually go in and measure those axes. And that's called canonical analysis, and we'll talk about that after the break. So the question is, is selection weak or strong? And there's a couple of ways to frame this. So one way to frame it is let's actually take the King solver value that a one devia standard deviation change in your trait changes fitness by 0.16. So if you take a typical heritability of about 4%, only 16 generations are required to shift the population mean by one standard deviations and only 80 generations to shift it by five standard deviations. So even though that amount may look small, it has the intrinsic potential of giving you very large shifts in your population very quickly. The other way to think about it was if you um, look at this value of 16%, a typical population spans four standard deviations, two above the mean, two below the mean. And that means there is 64% variation among relative fitness of individuals within your population. That's a pretty big gap. So this number of 0.16, one way to assess if it's weak or not is to ask how, what does that imply in terms of how wide fitness is it in a population sample and also how quickly can the mean change. The other way to get at this is, remember we talked about mean standardized gradients? So mean standardized means that instead of taking my data and dividing it and expressing it in standard deviations, I take my data and I express it in terms of fraction of the means. The advantage of mean standardized gradients is if my trait is fitness itself, the mean standardized gradient of fitness with respect to fitness is one. So when you look at a bunch of traits here, you got the, the median value of, of beta, once you correct for that, was 0.31. So a typical trait in their study had about 30% of selection on that compared to if the trait was selection itself. That's awfully strong. And what Poole and other people suggested, well, maybe that's the case because the gradients people choose, most of those aren't for lifetime fitness, but they're specific episodes of selection. And furthermore, they typically measure traits they think are important. So again, there's this ascertainment issue we keep on coming back to where that number may be fairly inflated. But the bottom line is this question about how strong is strong, you can make that a bit more focused by asking how quickly characters change, by what the breadth of fitness variation would be, or how strong that is relative to if I select just on fitness itself. The last analysis on that was a really um, uh, interesting uh, thing by Hendry, where they took a whole bunch of historical data and what they looked at was the rate at which populations change. And so if you look at the Endler data are the stars here, and the King Solver data are the solid lines. So Endler was a much smaller study. Then what you do, can do is, is ask in nature over long-term studies, you see a shift in populations. What selection intensity maintained at constant rates would you need to get that? And if you assume a heritability of about 10%, or a heritability of about 40%. And the key feature here is you see that if you're closer here, it means you have more smaller values. And so the, the take home from this is the values reported by King Solver and Endler are much larger than the values, if those values were constant, that you'd see traits change at in nature over long-term studies. And their argument was, well, maybe these large values are because you get episodes, episodes of selection. You get a big burst of change, and then the environment changes. Whereas these uh, curves here are sort of looking at what's the continual average rate of evolution when you look over fairly long time spans. So it's another way to think about how biased the set may or may not be. And again, the chapter goes in details on that. There's just two other things I want to talk about really quickly. So one of the big concerns is are there fitness trade-offs? We saw that in the mimulus example where large plants with the ability to make large flowers leave more offspring if they survive, but they have a much lower rate of survival. That's an example of a trade-off. 
The concern has always been, in almost the unstated assumption, that trade-offs are pretty common. So you can actually now use the data to look at that. There are a number of studies where people have looked at the same traits for survival versus fecundity, survival versus mating, and mating versus fecundity. So if trade-offs are important, you'd expect lots of values in this quadrant, which is positive for one, negative for the second, or down here, positive for one, negative for the second. Values here mean they're reinforcing. It means the trait works in the same direction for those two fitness traits. What you basically see is it's kind of random. If anything, there's slightly more in along this axis. So if trade-offs were important, most of the points would be in this quadrant and that quadrant, because you're good in one, you're bad in the other. Here is good in, in both or bad in both. And if anything, it seems there's slightly more data in here. But the bottom line is there's no obvious excess numbers showing trade-offs. So this is probably the most clean study for how common trade-offs can be. You obviously see things reported where they find them because they're interesting. If you look at the meta-analysis of the data, you don't really see that pattern. Now, it may change as people put more data in, but for now, you don't see huge inflations in these two quadrants, suggesting trade-offs are less important. The last thing is, what about temporal variation, right? And a quick way to look at temporal variation is I have a series of estimates, so betas over one or more time points. I take the absolute value of each estimate. I take the mean. That removes the sign. Conversely, I take the mean, which includes the sign, and then when I compute all that mean, it takes the absolute value of that. So if there's lots of fluctuations, I'm going to be below this line. Why? Because if I remove the sign and add those up, I get a larger value than if I add the sign in here. So quadrants down here, you always expect the data to be below here because any if all the values have the same sign, they'll be on the line. If even a single value differs in the sign, they'll be below the line. What you basically see, though, is... There's not an overwhelming huge signal in here. If selection changed direction rather dramatically, especially for strong selection, you'd expect there to be a big signal up here, but if it, you go, it goes from minus two, plus two, minus two, plus two, that gives you a value uh, 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 near zero, but you expect big signals down here. You don't see that. So there certainly is temporal fluctuation in selection, but not quite as much, and the best way is that Morrison and Hadfield did this very nice meta-analysis where they showed that 88% of all the variation that you see in fitness is variation between samples, not temporal variation. So there's a lot of stuff in the literature about how common temporal variation is, and the chapter talks about a couple of people where people actually tried to look at that a bit more carefully. So, the fitness data suggests that trade-offs aren't nearly as important as people think, and likewise, um, temporal variation, it certainly occurs, but it's not nearly as bad um, or doesn't ha have nearly the impact as people think. Again, just based upon these studies. There are a lot of studies. As you add more data, they may, they may, this, this thing may show up. But one way to ask about general patterns is you ask if you get a large number of independent characters and look for features on those independent characters. You don't see trade-offs, and you don't see huge effects for signs changing rather dramatically. Okay. So questions about any of that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's from, uh, well, it's in the book, and the book is the reference for that. But that is from one of the uh, one of the King Solver papers. Um, King Solver, I think King Solver and Diamond. The reference is in the book. Yeah. So some nice meta analysis. And by the way, there are a bunch of issues on meta analysis I went over quickly. Those are more detailed in the chapter and also in the appendix on meta analysis. Yeah. Question.
Yeah, so what this slide is simply, so, so what this is simply saying is, okay, I've got a bunch of traits, and I take those traits where I've measured two different fitness components. Do I see a trade-off? And you don't. That's... Yeah, as I said, mating, mating, mating. Well, survival, no, but survival's in there. But but here, but here's here's the here's the broader issue, the, the the broader point. The broader point isn't necessarily this is what nature's like. The broader point is here is how you would test that idea. So if you're concerned about trade-offs, what you can do, and you think for for example, they're at, at different stages in the life cycle. By the way, only one uh, only one name in there. I was just checking. I saw you running off twenty or thirty. Not that you'd pull a fast one, but you know. Um, so if you want to, if you think of maybe the trade-offs are, for example, early survival versus adult survival, you can put those in and check. So this is how you would look at that general issue about trade-offs. Sure. So trade-offs are something that people in life history always talk about. And the bottom line is, you have to let the data actually tell you what's out there. Because the other thing is, have you seen what are called Y models? So Y models are basically, think about a Y, and imagine you have one trait is uh, let's say, survival and number of offspring. So you have energy coming in, and then you partition. Do I want to put money, you know, making sure I survive, or money making sure? And that model would suggest that you, know, you get trade-offs, because you have a certain amount of stuff coming in, and you have to partition them. Mm -hmm. The problem, though, is if you increase the amount of stuff that comes in, so increase the base of that Y, you can have positive correlations. Mm -hmm. So some nice things on Y models, which actually, are, unfortunately, they're in volume three, not volume two, that basically show you that depending upon the situation, you either expect negative correlations or you expect positive correlations, depending upon if your genes are in terms of getting energy or your genes are in terms of partitioning the energy you have. So, you know, again, yeah, email me, I'll send you that section. Just, I'll, I'll, I'll. Right. Uh -huh. Sure. Yeah, so so a lot of things I chat about, the nice thing about the book is that I try to reference it pretty extensively, and so you can actually look at those. Now, that's an entry into broader questions in there. So Crohn's a good review. There's also uh, a couple of reviews based upon plant morpho mor plant physiological features. So there's a lot of, lot, of, lot of, I gave you kind of the quick comic book version. There's a lot of detail in there. 